Bill Mobley for the Brain Channel, and happy to be here today with Eliza Masley, a professor of neurosciences at UCSD. Eliza, welcome. Hi, thank and you. Let's start with your terrific story here at UCSD and all the important things that you've uh, encountered, but let's start with you and your history, if we could. Sure, well, I uh, came to San Diego and to UCSD about 30 years ago, um, basically following my wife, Aida. She's originally here from San Diego. And, uh, well, I, I received my uh, a medical degree in Mexico and I did a career on pathology and neuropathology there. And then uh, after we got married, uh, since Aida is from San Diego, we decided to come here. And uh, the first thing I did was to look for an opportunity or a job at UCSD. And I was incredibly lucky to meet uh, Dr. Bob Terry. Mm -hmm. I knew about him through a classical pathology book, the Robbins book, and there was a picture of one of his uh, discoveries on that book representing a tangle of Alzheimer's mm -hmm. disease. So, and his name was quoted in there. So uh, that's how I knew about him and I knew he was here. So I went and talked to him and uh, he gave me an opportunity. And uh, I started to work with him uh, initially as a research associate. And then eventually I became a postdoctoral fellow with him. And then I uh, got my first grant and became a junior faculty. And then uh, he retired and I stayed as a faculty in the lab, and then I continue to progress uh, through the years, and I've been uh, incredibly happy and delighted to be here, surrounded by so many fantastic colleagues like yourself, and uh, just being uh, very excited about the science that we do together here, and uh, working primarily, as you know, on. Um, the pathogenesis of uh, Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease, also doing some work on HIV neurodegeneration and uh, trying to develop uh, new therapeutics for these uh, and other neurodegenerative disorders. The things that you've done the, the, to, through your career have been so instrumental for helping all the rest of us figure out what is pathogenesis? What's it look like in these various animal models? How do you create a model that replicates the key features of pathogenesis? And then once you've done that, how do you pursue that? Uh, tell me about your, if you will, uh, epic uh, uh, movement through these models and what you've learned. Yeah, well, that's actually a very interesting and complex question. But the truth is that when we started to do this, when we started to try to develop models of a Alzheimer, Parkinson, and other neurodegenerative diseases, we really didn't know anything about the genetics of these diseases. Mm -hmm. This was the, in the pre-genetics era of uh, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and so on. So we could only go by the biochemistry and the little that we knew about the neuropathology. So um, I, I was extremely lucky in those days uh, working with another very highly esteemed and beloved colleague, uh, Tsunao Saito. Mm -hmm. And uh, with Tsunao, we discovered that a component of the amyloid plaques of Alzheimer's disease uh, actually, that also play a role in, in the pathogenesis of uh, Alzheimer's disease, was actually in the mix with the amyloid of the plaques. So we actually were able to isolate this component and we called it noble amyloid component and then basically back engineer from what we learn about the sequence of this protein mm. and uh, design uh, an animal model based on what we knew about that protein. But again, as I said, we didn't know anything about the genetics. At the same time that we were trying to trace back the gene based on the protein information that we had, and our idea was to generate a, a transgenic model, uh, a lot of the new genetics started to come out about Alzheimer's disease and about Parkinson's disease. And it turns out that uh, this protein that we were following, that we called at that time NAC precursor or NACP, actually was homologous to another molecule called alpha synuclein. Mm. And then it turns out that mutations on alpha synuclein were related to mm. Parkinson's disease. And at the time, we also thought that were going to be related to Alzheimer's disease. 
So what we did is that um, we took the gene, at that time we were able to clone the gene from human brains, we took this gene and we were able to generate uh, a transgenic animal model, that is a model that overexpressed these proteins specifically in the brain, and to generate the first transgenic model. So we thought that this model was going to mimic some aspects of Alzheimer's disease and some aspects of Parkinson's disease, but it turns out to mimic mostly uh, Parkinson's disease, and that's when the genetics of Parkinson's disease came and show that of cynuclein mutations were involved in Parkinson's disease. So <laughs> a, a lot of interesting uh, things happening. In, in the Alzheimer field, that's where, when the mutations on APP came up. Right. And at that time, we were also collaborating with uh, Leonard Mookie that at the time was here at Scripps, and with uh, Dora Game uh, that was at uh, Athena Neuroscience in those days. And we were lucky to have the gene at hand and to have a novel promoter and to generate a new transgenic model that uh, became, at that time, the state of the art in transgenic models. And uh, the idea with all these animal models was really to recapitulate the different stages of the disease from the very early stage that we believe is the damage to the synaptic connections to the later stages when uh, the neuronal cells uh, die. But as you know, it turns out that really these models are models of uh, genetics forms of the disease and um, there is a need to develop the new generation mm -hmm. of models that might mimic more the the garden variety of these diseases, which is exactly what it's currently being developed, but we don't have that yet. You know, it's very interesting. So you start with some pretty fundamental observations about the pathology of Alzheimer's disease, and you move to observations of uh, Parkinson's, and then the genetics comes in, which makes you even more comfortable that what you're looking at is meaningful. Absolutely. And then you build models, and with the building of models, you create many new opportunities for understanding pathogenesis. And, you know, it's not like we're done figuring out Alzheimer's or Parkinson's yet. And yet, uh, there's a theme, there's a series of themes that really resonate across both sporadic but also um, uh, familial Alzheimer's that really has informed your work. How are you taking these multiple observations and, and creating a new synthesis around that? Yeah, well, I, I, I don't know if this would answer your question or not, but really, I mean, our first observation with these models, either of Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's disease, or of the combined form of Alzheimer and Parkinson, that is what we call Lewy body dementia, really, uh, turn our attention to the to the synapse mm -hmm. uh, uh, and mm -hmm. to the connectivity mm -hmm. in the nervous system. I think that uh, uh, most of the work that other groups were doing were more focused on trying to find inclusions yeah. in the cells or extracellular aggregates uh, depositing around the cells. And this was also interesting to us, but really what we noticed in, in all these models and in the very early stages is that all these proteins involved in, in Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and other neurodegenerative disorders are proteins that are uh, localized to the synaptic connections and that they play a role under physiological conditions on, on, on um, synaptic connectivity, synaptic plasticity, and so on, and that under disease conditions, they interfere with the function of the synapse and they disrupt um, uh, the, the communication among neurons. So that really was our um, focus. And that also became sort of like the central theme, yes. also the work and the research, to try and understand how the synapse is affected in the most early stages and also how we can, can prevent that. So if, if the synapse is the early point of, of departure from normal, what are the therapies that make sense for preventing synaptic dysfunction? Hmm. Wow, yeah. Uh, I, I think that uh, probably uh, you have uh, three to four potential uh, possibilities. Uh, since most of these proteins appear to be like uh, amyloid beta protein, tau, alpha-synuclein, and so on, most of these proteins appear to be accumulating at the synaptic side, mm -hmm. forming uh, these small aggregates mm -hmm. that we call oligomers. Um, 
I think you either have to reduce the synthesis of the precursor of these proteins, uh, increase the clearance, mm -hmm. or, or let's say the disposal of the excess of these proteins, or reduce the tendency of these proteins to, to aggregate. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and there is a fourth now, a new component of the theory, which is um, that these uh, aggregate of proteins also spread through the synapses, and they damage the synapse only, not only by accumulating locally at the synapse, but also by getting transmitted or propagating from uh, one synapse to the next. So either decrease synthesis, increase clearance, decrease aggregation, or reduce the propagation of these aggregates would be the, the four logical strategies. And uh, this could be achieved by a number of different uh, tools or mechanisms, either by suppressing uh, genomic expression of these proteins by using antisense or using small molecules that inhibit uh, mm -hmm. aggregation or propagation, or also as we have uh, been working for a number of years now, uh, utilizing antibodies mm -hmm. that either neutralize these proteins or suppress the production of some of these proteins, or even more enhance the clearance mm -hmm. of these uh, aggregated proteins at, at the synaptic side. Uh, we find that either utilizing small molecules or antibodies is a relatively effective um, way to, to affect all these four different uh, potential pathways. And you know, what's, what's interesting, I think, to the field now is that some of these new strategies really focus on um, using antibodies to eliminate, if you will, yeah. to take up these proteins. So what's very exciting, and probably not everybody who's listening will get it, but the idea that one neuron can spread its problem to another neuron in a circuit is very exciting. Yeah. It, how, how, how does it happen that one neuron is in communication with another neuron in such a way to make that second neuron sick, and by the way, is that second neuron in turn able to propagate that to yet a third one? And that's really interesting work, and you've been doing it. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, in reality, a lot of this work was uh, initially started by Stan Prusiner several years mm -hmm. ago, trying to understand how uh, mad cow disease, Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease, and other prion disorders mm -hmm. uh, propagate. But in, in those days, he was focused on the idea that there was a propagation of the uh, protein structure, let's say, the, of the aberrant or, or, or abnormal protein structure, and that one abnormal prion protein could transmit that abnormal to, to a normal prion protein and mm -hmm. therefore propagate. I think what we have discovered uh, with diseases like Alzheimer's disease, like Parkinson's disease, even Huntington disease, frontotemporal dementia, is that not only the aberrant protein structure could be transmitted from one protein to another, but actually a, a, um, aberrantly aggregated proteins could, as you mentioned, uh, transmit from one cell to the next, mm -hmm. and from that cell to the next, and from that cell to the next, and, and really strikingly, disrupt uh, a network. So as we know um, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, and other really had network dysfunction mm -hmm. disorder. So it's not only that one brain structure is malfunctioning, but it's one brain structure that transmits to the next and mm -hmm. to the next. And another interesting discovery in the field has been that um, uh, we can actually stage the disease both mm -hmm. by imaging as well as by neuropathology as well as clinically. Mm -hmm. um, in, in uh, different stages where the disease is concentrated in one brain region initially and then it moves to another brain region and to another brain region and clinically that manifests uh, as, as a different symptomatology. And that appears, at least the hypothesis is that that appears to be related to the transmission of the abnormal protein structure from one cell to the next either through the synaptic connections or through the transmission of abnormal Pro protein structures to normal protein structures and so on. It's amazing. Amazing, yeah. It's amazing and, and, and it opens up this sort of network theory, if you will, of degenerative disease in a way that I think is 
so encouraging. Uh, Eliza, you've got uh, a, a great perspective on the growth of Alzheimer's disease and the growth of other degenerative diseases. Um, what's going to happen? How, how are we with additional funding uh, as neuroscientists? How are we going to take advantage of the, of the really the new funding available to all of us uh, to, if you will, uh, uh, figure this whole thing out, to, to get to the next stage where we understand which of those mechanisms that you've mentioned uh, are really in play and how we can best attack them. Yeah, I, I think that what we have learned through the years, and this is something that you and I have done through the years as well, is that neither of us could, as a single person, a single lab, solve these huge problems and that there is a need of forming uh, cooperative uh, agreements, consortiums for groups of scientists mm -hmm. uh, trying to get together uh, and resolve these problems. For example, uh, in my lab, we have all these animal models and you and your lab have all these expertise in, in axonal transport and genetic manipulations and so on. And uh, maybe Steve Wagner in his lab has expertise in uh, developing small molecules and Robert Risman, the expertise on the biomarkers. So uh, the way to take advantage of all these new funding coming for Alzheimer's disease and for related disorders is really by forming mm -hmm. uh, cooperatives, by forming uh, consortiums where groups of scientists use their, their expertise, their individual expertise in a complementary way that could uh, accelerate and amplify uh, the, the discoveries, particularly the, those discoveries that would lead to therapeutics in, in, in the next uh, few years. And I think that, uh, well, to me, UCSD has been exactly that. You know, you have that potential to link with so many amazing investigators, both at the university as well as at the Salk and Scripps and other places, where you can really form these uh, collaborative agreements or consortiums and uh, push uh, the science ahead. I think also moving these collaborative agreements, not only in our local environment, but also with other UC campuses or, or other institutions in the region. And again, uh, our strengths uh, uh, synergizing with the strengths of others, I, I think that's de definitely the, the, the way to go. And I think we need to foster and we need to work toward uh, more collaborative uh, science. I think uh, that, that's a very important, very important issue. Now, I only spoke about collaborating among academic institutions, but as you know, also the, the recommendations uh, for, from the Alzheimer's Summit Mm -hmm. uh, to accelerate uh, Alzheimer research and uh, accomplish the milestones for 2025. Also call for cooperative agreements with um, uh, biotechnology companies, with pharmaceutical companies, with nonprofit uh, institutions. So I, I think, again, this idea of collaboration, cooperation, it's, it's very important both between academic and uh, industry to, to advance the, the, the milestones. It's going to take a, more than a village yep. to make this work. We're very happy that you're part of our village, Eliza. Thanks thank so you. much for no, being thank here you very much. for your great work. Yeah, no, thank you. Bill Mobley for the uh, Brain Channel, and thanks for joining. <laughs>